Thank you, Justine. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And thank you all for joining me uh, in this webinar today. Um, it's my great pleasure to uh, present to you the seismic interferometry, uh, which is the technique I'm going to use. And, and the second part of my title, the 4D monitoring of groundwater fluctuations and beyond. Uh, here, 4D means one dimension in time plus three dimensions in space. So this second part of my title means that uh, my talk today will be focusing on one monitoring application about the groundwater fluctuations in California. Um, but this uh, seismological approach I present here uh, can be used to monitor a variety of near surface processes. So the time scale of these processes uh, will be say from a couple of days to a few decades. And the spatial scales I'm looking at are, uh, say, from the Earth's surface to a few kilometer depth. Before going into details, I want to first acknowledge my advisors, uh, my PhD advisors, Michelle Cambio and Rob Ryan Hughes, and my postdoc advisors, Greg Barraza and Bill Ellsworth, who provided um, insightful guidance as well as my collaborators uh, from a couple of institutions around the world uh, who made important contributions to the work I'm going to present today. Let me start with our ever-changing planet. We all know that the Earth is changing all the time. Uh, some changes involve very slowly on a time scale of millions of years. But many other processes, especially those occurring in the Earth's shallow subsurface, can develop very rapidly on timescales um, comparable to, say, a human's lifetime or the duration of a PhD. These near surface processes are uh, very often related to water resources, geoenergy, or geohazards. So they can lead to significant impacts on our society. Today, I'll share with you a, a novel technique based on continuous seismic data. This seismological technique allows us to monitor and image various near surface processes. With my presentation today, uh, I hope to convince you that this novel technique opens up really a wide range of possibilities for monitoring and understanding near surface processes. And it really revolutionizes the way on geoscientists and geoengineers address environmental problems. My, uh, in my talk today, I'll showcase the promise of this approach by focusing on the water problem. So uh, you probably all know that in recent years, uh, historic levels of droughts have been ravaging numerous regions worldwide, including the United States in particular. This diagram shows that um, over the past two decades, from 2000 to um, 2022, uh, over one third of continental US has been suffering from different levels of droughts. The lower left figures compare Lake Mead, which is the largest reservoir in the States, in uh, 2000 with um, pretty adequate water storage, and in 2021 at a record low. Not sure if you've seen this news before um, as a very unexpected, unexpected byproduct of the decreasing water level, um, dead bodies are getting uncovered in Lake Mead. So this piece of news uh, was about the first dead body they found. Uh, and the last time I checked, they had already found five and still counting. As shown in the lower right map, uh, the summer of 20. 21 uh, really witnessed extreme droughts gripping the entire Southwest. So uh, this mega drought in the Western US over the past de two decades uh, was demonstrated to be the driest period since at least 1200 years ago. What's making the situation even worse um, is the ever increasing human population, which together with the drought are really bringing the water security to a tipping point. Now, if we think about the source of water supply, taking California, for example, in a dry year, um, in fact, over 6% of the fresh water supply comes from groundwater. So groundwater means the water stored below the Earth's surface. 
uh, it's defined as opposed to surface water, uh, as in lakes, rivers, and streams. So uh, needless to say that in urgent demand now is really a refined understanding about the groundwater aquifers. Ideally, we would hope to know both the spatial structures as well as the temporal variations of groundwater systems. Speaking of California, uh, what else is California famous for? As a seismologist, you know my answer must be uh, earthquakes. As shown in the uh, red map, California is prone to high seismic hazards due to all the known and unknown faults. And for a place like this, we know that uh, there must have been or will be tremendous seismic stations. So initially, most of these stations were designed uh, for earthquake, earthquake warning, warning or studies of tectonics. But it would be super if we can also use them to deal with droughts, right? It's going to be buy one, get one free, both for USGS and for the community. So in my talk today, I'll explore uh, whether and to what level we can use seismic data um, to monitor groundwater systems. Here is an outline of my presentation today. It contains many four parts. The first part is, a, uh, is an introduction to aquifer monitoring. The second part pertains to the methodology about the space-time seismic interferometry. In the third part, I'll use a pilot application in Los Angeles to study the groundwater systems. And the last part will be uh, my thoughts and discussion looking forward. On the outset is an introduction to the current status and challenges of aquifer monitoring. First, let's have a look at the uh, typical structures of water barrier informations in the shallow shot subsurface. So here is a vertical slice from the Earth's surface to about maybe a couple of meters um, deep. And this type of structures can uh, very often extend to hundreds of meters below the surface. And the tree here is not a scale. This slide shows nicely the uh, layer structures of shallow sediments. Um, first, we have uh, this type of layers, many made of clays uh, with finer grains. We also have this type of layers, uh, many made of sand and gravels with coarser grains. We know that the groundwater is mostly housed uh, in the coastal grains, sands, and gravels uh, in this pore space. And so this type of uh, sands and gravel layers are called aquifers. And the aquifer layers are interbedded among clay layers that uh, typically uh, bear very little water. So how to know the amount of water hidden in these underground systems? The traditional way is to drill a well and measure the hydraulic head or groundwater table. So um, people tend to think of this um, groundwater table data as ground, ground truth uh, because they are very direct and in situ measurements. However, uh, each well only gives a point scale measurement at exactly where we drill, right? Uh, we don't know what's in between two wells or uh, even just was shallower or deeper. But in practice, those wells are so expensive to drill. For example, in California, it uh, takes about $200 uh, thousand dollars to drill a well at 50 meter depths. And the price increases uh, exponentially with depths. So um, because of the expensive cost of drilling wells, the um, sampling, actually, this both the spatial sampling and the temporal sampling of well data are still um, too sparse, uh, far from sufficient to capture the highly non-uniform aquifer structures. So it's still pretty much as in the blind man and the elephant parable. If we only rely on the point scale well measurements, um, then our understanding about the aquifer structures or temporal variations could be severely biased by some, you know, due to some just very localized heterogeneities. 
In recent years, GPS and INSAR have emerged as very attractive tools for uh, aquifer monitoring. The basic idea is shown on this famous photo, uh, which was taken in San Joaquin Valley in California. So uh, in San Joaquin Valley or Central California, um, the groundwater depletion has been excessive since last century um, due to the heavy demand for irrigation purposes. So shown on this map, uh, on this photo, the signs on the pole uh, indicates the altitude of the ground surface in different years. For example, the ground surface was around here in 1925, uh, it sank to here in 1955, and to here in 1977. So this photo uh, indicates about nine meters subsidence over half a century, which if you think about it, is really impressive. The basic mechanism for this um, drastic surface subsidence, or sometimes it could be uh, surface uplift, is that on the pyroelastic aquifer medium uh, in the aquifers uh, are really serving as a uh, sponge sucked, uh, sucked in water like this. So by measuring at the surface uh, how much the sponge is dilated or uh, squeezed, uh, we can infer the changes in pore pressure and thus the changes in groundwater level. This approach has really helped significantly um, benefiting from the high precision and temporal resolution of GPS, as well as the high spatial resolution of INSAR. The challenge of this approach, however, uh, is that the this um, surface measurements, uh, they lack the very important information about vertical variations, or sometimes they just don't have enough sensitivity to uh, processes occurring at depths. Also, at the end of the day, what people are really interested in is the changes in groundwater storage. Um, but in practice, uh, it's actually quite challenging to translate from surface displacement to groundwater storage, considering all these elastic loading and inelastic um, effects. There are some other spaceborne or airborne sensing techniques. Uh, for example, the uh, satellite gravimetry or airborne electromagnetic. Those methods are uh, very helpful too, um, but they suffer from similar limitations regarding the expensive cost uh, as well as uh, the depth resolution. So, uh, as I mentioned, today I'll present a unique seismological observation um, to bring new perspectives to aquifer monitoring. Specifically, uh, the quantity we measure is called delta V over V. Here, V means seismic velocity or the propagation speed of seismic waves. So we know that uh, seismic velocity is unique to the mechanical state of crustal rocks. For example, at higher effective pressure, uh, seismic waves propagate faster and vice versa. Then the entire delta V over V means relative changes in seismic velocity. So it pertains to changes both in time and in space. The idea for us is then to associate, uh, to, to measure the variations in delta V over V and use that to track the uh, variations in groundwater volume. So uh, this idea of using seismic velocity changes to uh, track the changes in say water volume of rocks has long been used in laboratory scale rock physics experiments. But only in recent years uh, have seismologists been able to measure uh, delta V over V um, continuously in realistic scales. So how to do that? Uh, that brings me to my second uh, part about the methodology. First, let's look at the time dimension, that is how to measure data V over V continuously in time. So this incorporates seismic interferometry in two steps. Uh, for first step, uh, it's the interferometry of uh, seismic ambient noise. So uh, the basic idea is that we know that the um, Earth's surface is vibrating all the time, 
everywhere as I speak. Um, due to perhaps anthropogenic activities, uh, ocean waves, or just the winds. It's just most of the time, these ambient ground vibrations are too small that we human beings don't really notice. Um, but these continuous vibrations are being recorded continuously by seismometers, as shown here. If we look at those um, continuous records, they can be, they seem to be very noisy and somewhat random. That's why um, traditional seismologists consider this type of records as noise rather than signal. But in recent years, seismologists have shown mathematically that if we calculate the uh, wave interference between the noise records at two seismic receivers, we can actually extract something very useful, um, the signals shown in these black waveforms. So these black waveforms, we can see uh, it contains two parts, the uh, causal part on the right side and anti-causal part on the left side. So this waveforms is basically estimates of Green's functions, uh, which characterize the uh, seismic properties of the medium between two seismic receivers. So with that, uh, we can then uh, you know, decipher the um, elastic properties uh, of the medium. So this idea has really been a game changer in seismology because we know that all this noise, uh, they are continuous in time omnipresent in space, which means that seismologists no longer uh, really require earthquakes or uh, artificial sources uh, to decipher the underground medium. So this is a very cost-effective and non-invasive approach. Uh, you just deploy the seismometers there and you get all the data you want. Then uh, use, based on this idea, uh, we can, uh, if we do this type of ambient noise interferometry during different time periods, uh, we can extract the Green's functions on say consecutive dates. The second step, is then uh, colder wave interferometry. So colder waves are these later rubbles on the Green's functions. They come from waves that are multiply scattered uh, in the subsurface before they arrive on the surface. So by calculating uh, the small time shifts between these colder waveforms, uh, we can extract the delta V over V, which is just the opposite of delta V over T, uh, from this um, time shifts. The uh, most important advantage of colder waves is that um, because they, you know, they've been traveling in the subsurface for a very long time, so they are very sensitive to the small medium perturbations. Uh, we could uh, achieve a sensitivity of 0.01% of delta V over V with colder wave measurements. I want to emphasize that uh, with the traditional methods of uh, colder wave interferometry, uh, one can only uh, detect the temporal variations um, due to the assumption made in these traditional methods. Now uh, we are trying to push this uh, monitoring approach to another level by also image the spatial distributions of delta V over V. So this advancement uh, of you know, imaging data over in space is made possible uh, benefiting from many uh, recent uh, progress on the theoretical studies of uh, colder wave or say colder wave sensitivity kernels. As shown on this maps, the colder wave sensitivity kernels uh, describe statistically the colder waves travel paths. Uh, for example, shown here, uh, this, uh, the colors here uh, kind of describe where the colder waves are more sensitive to uh, and where the colder waves are less sensitive to. Sensitive to. With this type of uh, so-called colder wave sensitivity kernels, uh, we can then relate the delta V over V spatial distribution, that is the uh, thing we want to resolve, uh, with delta T at different lapse times. So this orange part is something we can directly measure from uh, the colder waveforms. 
The format of this equation may seem familiar to you as appeared in many um, geophysical problems because it means that we can then basically uh, solve for the spatial uh, distribution of delta V over V with an inverse problem here. Uh, the design matrix G contains all the uh, sensitivity kernels that we can theoretically calculate. Uh, the D matrix contains all the um, delta T uh, observations we can directly measure. And then the model parameters are the spatial distributions of delta V over V we will uh, invert for. Here, uh, as a pilot application, I just use the Tarantola formula to solve this inverse problem. And if we repeat this type of code of imaging on consecutive days, uh, we can de derive the uh, say time-lapse images of delta V over V, which is basically the spatial temporal variations of delta V over V. So uh, now we are all set with the nitty gritties of the technical aspects. Then I want to give you a brief idea of what I mean by spatial temporal measurements of delta V over V. So here, uh, the lower map shows my study area in metropolitan Los Angeles. And the time series of delta V over V measured at this orange circle is plot on the upper panel. Now I'll show you a small movie, uh, which will uh, display the temporal changes of delta V over V at every point uh, in this um, map. And in this movie, you will see um, bluish color corresponding to more groundwater and reddish color um, corresponding to less groundwater. So the details in this movie will be explained later in my talk. And just here, you can see a general change from bluish color. Uh, you can see pretty uh, bluish at this point, um, but gradually it will change into reddish color. Now the entire area is pretty reddish. So this change um, corresponding to, corresponds to an overall decline of groundwater in the study area. And on the red side, uh, I'm showing you a comparison with GPS and INSAR in terms of resolution. So GPS excels in its high temporal resolution, whereas INSAR in its high spatial resolution. Then our space-time delta V over V falls around here. So you can see it kind of um, compromise, uh, compromises the advantages of both GPS and INSAR. I want to emphasize that uh, delta, compared to the surface deformation measured by GPS and INSAR, um, delta V over V is a different physical property. And essentially, it reflects changes in the mechanical properties of the media or say it's determined by elastic moduli and bulk density. So it's often related to deformation, but not the same as deformation. With that, uh, now I'll move on to the third part uh, where I'll go into more details about this groundwater systems in Los Angeles. In this part, I'll introduce the hydrogeological background first, and then I'll look at the temporal and spatial changes uh, respectively. So here, uh, this is my study area in metropolitan Los Angeles, um, comprising a number of groundwater basins, primarily are this uh, Santa Ana Basin and LA Central Basin. So uh, these basins are mostly bounded, uh, bounded by mountains and faults, uh, also part, uh, partially partitioned by municipal borders. Oh, I want to mention that uh, each of these basins is managed by an individual water department. The uh, groundwater storage in this area uh, exhibits strong seasonal variations uh, because of precipitations that mostly occur in winter. So those winter precipitations will recharge the groundwater reservoir. But in dry summers, uh, there are not much um, precipitation, uh, but very heavy well pumping. So those uh, anthropogenic well pumping will uh, withdraw water from this groundwater reservoir. Another interesting feature of the uh, groundwater basins in this area is that 
Um, for these two basins, the uh, northeast portion is characterized as an unconfined or forebay area, which means that um, these aquifers are uh, mostly made of sand and gravels, uh, whereas the south west portion is characterized as a confined zone. Um, that means the aquifers in this area are confined by laterally extensive clay layers. So um, because of the very different um, content of sediments in these two portions, uh, we know that uh, in the confined zone, the aquifers could um, deform drastically corresponding to the seasonal groundwater fluctuations. So uh, this is the spongy part. Uh, in contrast, the unconfined zone, uh, due to the lack of you know, compressible clay content, uh, it actually deforms very little. So to calculate delta V over V, uh, I used about 50 broadband seismic stations uh, in the metropolitan Los Angeles. On the right side, uh, I I'm showing you the time series of delta V over V uh, averaged over the entire study area from 2000 to 2020. So you may notice that the uh, vertical axis of uh, delta V over V is flipped. Uh, this is for a more intuitive comparison with groundwater because now uh, upwards means more groundwater. The green line here uh, shows the uh, long-term trend of delta V over V, and the light blue bars on the bottom shows the uh, newer uh, cumulative precipitation. So with this um, plot, you could see uh, in this metropolitan Los Angeles area, uh, the, the, the green line shows an overall decreasing trend over the past two decades. Uh, corresponding to the long-term dearth of precipitation uh, in the study area. The long-term decreasing, decreasing trend of the gray line uh, was interrupted um, briefly uh, several times. Uh, so if we compare uh, this uh, briefly increasing episodes uh, with the uh, precipitation data, we could see those increasing episodes uh, correspond to of the years with maybe some storms in Los Angeles. I also want to notice uh, note that uh, we could see um, there are some seasonal uh, variations of delta V over V superimposed on the long-term trend. So these uh, seasonal patterns are associated with the annual hydrologic cycle, uh, mainly uh, controlled by two factors, uh, the rainfall uh, induced changes in winters, and then the pumping induced decrease of groundwater in dry summers. In particular, I want to mention one interesting year, that is uh, year of 2005, or really the winter of 2005. So during that winter, um, based on GPS stations in San Gabriel uh, Valley, uh, people observe uh, significant signals of uh, uplift and mostly extensional um, signals. So uh, we know that this area also falls uh, within the larger San Andreas fault system. So due to that uh, significant extensional signals, people were wondering at that time uh, if a big earthquake was going to happen. But uh, it turned out uh, it's just a year uh, with pretty uh, adequate precipitation in Los Angeles. So this plot gives us a, uh, an overall idea of the groundwater in the study area. For a more localized comparison, uh, now I zoom in uh, to the Santa Ana Basin. So the blue line on the red side uh, is delta V over V again, but this time it's only averaged within Santa Ana Basin. The yellow line with circles uh, is the hydraulic head or groundwater level uh, measured at a local uh, monitoring well. So this plot shows that uh, over the past two decades, um, the delta V over V and hydraulic head match very well with each other, both for the long-term trends and for the seasonal uh, fluctuations. 
this agreement uh, is actually very promising because it means that we can potentially leverage the large number of existing seismometers worldwide as an alternative way to monitor groundwater level, which is very encouraging because uh, this will uh, significantly improve the temporal and spatial density of well measurements uh, while avoiding the expensive cost of drilling and maintaining uh, groundwater monitoring wells. So uh, this type of temporal changes uh, tells us, you know, the general, uh, you know, trend. Um, but in order to really know uh, where and how these changes occur, uh, we want to know the spatial patterns of delta V over V. Now I'll move on to the spatial patterns uh, where I divide uh, the study area into two kilometer by two kilometer pixels and invert for delta V over V on each pixel. Shown on this map uh, is the seasonal amplitude of delta V over V on each pixel. So we extract the seasonal amplitude by uh, sine pseudo fading. And from this map, you can see the dominant seasonal changes in reddish color uh, concentrates in Santa Ana Basin. Um, so the, the uh, border or the shape of this reddish portion uh, actually corresponds uh, match quite well with the borders of Santa Ana Basin. Furthermore, uh, we can we also observe a sharp gradient along the four bay boundary and the reddish portion concentrate on the confined side, which makes sense. I can uh, further substantiate this delta V over V imaging with deformation map inferred from INSAR on the right side. So to be more precise, uh, this INSAR map is a measure of vertical displacement at the surface, whereas our delta V over V is a measure of elastic moduli and bulk density at depths. Despite uh, you know, being different physical properties, uh, these two maps show largely consistent features, um, both with uh, dominant seasonal um, changes in the confined zone of Santa Ana Basin. The main difference between these two images is perhaps this reddish portion in LA Central Basin, uh, which appears on the deformation map, but is missing uh, on delta V over V. So why is this difference? To answer that, uh, we need to think about one unique ability of our seismological approach, that is, Seismic waves of different frequencies um, travel at different depths. That means we could use seismic waves of different frequencies to probe the Earth's property at different depths. So this uh, left side map is measured within uh, one fre certain frequency band from 0.2 to 0.8 hertz. If I use more frequency bands, now from left to right are uh, measured with decreasing frequency bands uh, correspond to depths uh, you know, deeper and deeper below the surface. And you can see from shallower to deeper depths, um, the uh, reddish portion uh, seem to migrate southeastwards. But consistently across different depths, all the reddish portions con uh, concentrate on the confined side. If I display INSAR map, the INSAR map again, uh, we know that the INSAR or surface deformation is a vertically integrated measurement. Uh, it's an integration of the strain changes across different depths. So to some degree, we can see it as the uh, an integration of uh, changes at different depths in the three delta V over V maps. Now, if we sum really this reddish three reddish portions, uh, they began to assemble the features we see on INSAR. That means compared to uh, INSAR, uh, delta V over V also helps to characterize the uh, aquifers and their behaviors at different depths. This type of depth information could be very helpful for uh, decision makers in water agencies to optimize their pumping and drilling strategies. 
So, for example, we know that these days um, people were, you know, drilling deeper and deeper wells to get um, groundwater. Um, but before you drill, uh, it's really helpful to know how much uh, we would want to drill, right? Because it's really expensive. In the last part of uh, this LA case study, I want to uh, show you the long-term trend of Delta VORV. So shown on this map is Delta VORV accumulated from 2000 to 2020. And the bluish color corresponds to an cumulative increase of groundwater and the reddish color and cumulative decline. So you can see in San Gabriel and LA Central Basins, there is much less water now uh, than 20 years ago. But in uh, Santana Basin, uh, the water, groundwater seems to recover with a slight increase um, compared to two, uh, two decades ago. Note that uh, we observe um, opposite signs of cumulative changes in adjacent basins which is very interesting because we know that this border between LA Central and Santana is not a fault, meaning uh, there is no natural hydraulic barriers. It's a pure municipal border. Uh, for people who are more familiar with uh, Los Angeles, it's the Los Angeles County on the upper side and Orange County on the downside. So why the cumulative changes are so different? To answer that, uh, we want to look at the two seasonal components uh, separately. So for a given year, so this is the Delta VORV uh, in Santa Ana Basin, and we know that for a given year, the net annual change is mainly the sum of two factors, uh, the rainfall induced increase of groundwater in winters minus the pumping induced uh, decrease of groundwater in summers. So if I try to isolate these two seasonal components over all these years, I can get this diagram. Uh, so the horizontal axis is rainfall-induced delta VORV in winters, and the up, uh, vertical is the pumping-induced delta VORV in summers. I want to emphasize that uh, this is a very simplified model. Uh, there are certainly other um, components that are very seasonal, for example, the evapotranspiration. Um, but let's just say what uh, we can get with this very simplified model. So for, from this diagram, you can see in Santana Basin, uh, the rainfall-induced changes correlate linearly with pumping-induced changes, which means that in Santana Basin, they were uh, able to adjust the annual pumpage um, kind of based on the precipitation. So they achieved that by, you know, uh, estimating an annual quota for pumpage. And when the old local water agencies exceed their quota, uh, the water government in St. Anna Basin tried to increase the price for pumping. And by doing this, uh, they managed to maintain a long-term balance of uh, groundwater volume. Unfortunately, this has not been the case for the other two basins. Uh, shown on the left two uh, diagrams, you can see uh, in San Gabriel and LA Central Basins, there was little evidence of uh, uh, linear creation. Furthermore, there are more dots on the upper triangle corresponding to years when pumping induced changes exceed the uh, rainfall induced changes, that is the years of overdraft. And all these years, um, progressively lead to the long-term uh, depletion of groundwater in these two basins. So this type of analysis shows that um, anthropogenic activities plays a significant role in shaping the hyd shallow hydrologic systems, compounding the effect of climate change. And this type of uh, anthropogenic impact can now be verified and quantified by our seismological observations. Also, uh, it shows that Delta VORV can serve as a new way to assess groundwater budget. Uh, we know that this type of measurement is uh, independent from modeling, say traditional hydrologic modeling uh, based on stream flow, precipitation, and head measurements. So those type of traditional modeling could subject to um, big uncertainties without ac accurate aquifer model. And uh, now our Delta VORV 
can be used to calibrate and uh, you know uh, complement those traditional modeling. To conclude uh, this LA uh, case study, we measured the spatial temporal changes of Delta VORV in uh, Los Angeles from 2000 to 2020. And the temporal changes were verified by hydraulic head and the spatial imaging by uh, Delta VORV, uh, by uh, INSAR. And compared to INSAR, Delta VORV further characterizes the aquifer behaviors at different depths. We also show that Delta VORV can serve as a new type of observation to um, promote uh, data-informed water management. I also want to mention that uh, in California, uh, they passed this uh, historic legislation uh, in 2014, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, SIGMA. So SIGMA sets forth a statewide framework uh, where the, local, the government, the Water Department of California, uh, they provide uh, grants and uh, projects um, to uh, local water agencies to study uh, the groundwater and to implement uh, groundwater sustainable um, projects, the sustainability projects. Um, I know that there are already efforts going on to incorporate seismic reflection refractions into the statewide uh, groundwater flow model. And now with this 40 uh, Delta VORV data set, there are a lot more uh, we can do to contribute uh, to the water solutions here. Uh, now I'll go into the last part, uh, looking forward. So I hope with this LAK study, I've convinced you that Delta VORV can be a very promising uh, 4 d geodata set. It's uh, cost-effective, non-invasive, uh, very suitable for long-term monitoring of groundwater systems. And certainly, uh, this approach is not limited in California. Uh, we have all these existing seismometers around world, the world, uh, and we can just use this uh, existing data to um, do large-scale regional analysis of all the um, hydrologic systems. Also, um, Dr. V over V, uh, essentially it picks up changes in fluid content, stress field, and rock damages. So its power is not limited to groundwater systems, right? Uh, it can be used to um, for monitoring a wide range of processes. Uh, for example, the uh, fluids uh, extraction and uh, injection related to this oil and gas operations or uh, geothermal production. And also uh, there are a lot of processes uh, related to the hazard monitoring and assessment. Uh, for example, the volcanic unrest, landslides, glaciers were the freezing and thawing of permafrost uh, as, well, as well as for structure health monitoring. Those are all potential venues uh, for applying seismic interferometry monitoring. Uh, here, I'm hoping to show, in, show you a, a sneaky peek uh, view of an ongoing work about the geothermal production. So this is the geysers geothermal field in California, which is the largest geothermal field in the world. And uh, what I'm showing you now, uh, the yellow line is the net cumulative uh, production data uh, over the past uh, 16 years at the geysers. You can see both long-term um, variations and uh, seasonal patterns here. And the orange line uh, here shows the Delta V over V measurement. Uh, so before 2012, um, it's a little bit noisy because we didn't have dense seismic array, but after 2012, uh, the signal to noise ratio is much better. Um, with this comparison, you can see Delta V over V really um, match very well with the um, production data here, uh, which means that Delta V over V can serve as a very useful tool to really study the propagation or uh, migration of uh, pressure changes due to the uh, fluid or uh, stream uh, changes. Also, as I mentioned, this um, spatial uh, temporal uh, seismic interferometry is still a very new technique. 
and there are uh, many um, important uh, aspects to improve. So in this LA case study, we uh, provided the changes at three different depths. Um, this was limited by the traditional uh, uh, short window Fourier transform we used. But now we've developed a new technique based on wavelet cross-spectrum analysis, which greatly enhances uh, the uh, frequency resolution of this measurement. And thus, it could provide really a full depth profile of delta V over V. The codes of this new approach is available on my GitHub, and it will also be available in the new release of uh, MS Noise package. Uh, so MS Noise is uh, the most widely uh, used package for delta V over V uh, measurements, and uh, you will see uh, Wivler's uh, methods implemented in this package very soon. So this uh, could be very helpful for the depth resolution. Regarding the aerial resolution, uh, so for the LA case study, we were fortunate to have very dense uh, regular distribution of uh, seismic stations. But for more universal cases, um, this station coverage is typically uh, very regular, for example, in uh, Central California. Um, but there are many places like in Central California where the groundwater is a big problem. And we really want to have a good um, resolution assessment and um, go uh, as well as we can do with the aerial resolution. So to deal with these challenges, uh, we developed this new uh, coda wave imaging approach based on Voronoi tessellation. Uh, we could do adaptive grid machine uh, which will directly give uh, a quantitative assessment of the resolution for the color wave imaging. And the codes, uh, so the, the, the paper for this method is under review now, but the code is already available on my GitHub page. And from a uh, practical um, perspective, um, what I showed you today is basically a correlation between delta V over V and hydraulic heads. Um, but to uh, really directly inform uh, practical decision making, uh, we want to directly interpret delta V over V. The key to this uh, would be a quantitative interpretation of the delta V over V from, say, hydraulic head. Uh, and this will be uh, the next important step to uh, really improve. Uh, the last point uh, is regarding the hydrogeophysical data assimilation. So uh, for example, here I show you briefly data V over V and uh, INSAR in different uh, technical aspects. And you could see the horizontal resolution of INSAR is almost on parallel, uh, whereas the depth resolution of data V over V is just unique. Uh, that means these are really two uh, complementary technologies. And then physically, those are uh, very different physical properties. Um, so the idea would be try to uh, integrate or uh, jointly invert uh, these different types of measurement and to uh, eventually better constrain what's happening underground. With that, um, I hope to um, I hope that uh, I really convince you this space time data V over V is a very novel approach that is uh, revolutionizing the four D four D monitoring of near surface processes, and we could use this uh, passive seismic interferometry approach to study a variety of uh, near surface uh, uh, processes regarding groundwater, geoenergy, and geohazards. Uh, to better understand what's happening underground. With that, uh, I'd be happy to answer your questions. Wonderful talk. Thank you, Shujen, very much. Uh, we've had a number of questions come in uh, with um, various aspects of, of your very exciting work. So we'll try to um, get through as many of these as we can. One of the questions that came up a couple times related to the um, the seismic instrumentation and the network that you use uh, to collect these data so that you can do these great analyses. And you had a, a figure that showed kind of an estimate of your resolution and how that varied with your spatial, 
uh, your, your station density. I'm wondering if you could comment a bit about, is there like a minimum station density that you would need? Like say you had three stations and they were, I don't know, a hundred kilometers apart. Could you do anything with that? Or what would be the minimum uh, density that you would need to be able to do this kind of analysis? Yes, that's a very, very good question. So um, perhaps I could uh, go, am I? Uh, I'll try to go back to this approach. Uh, of, so of course, when we have denser station coverage, we could have better resolution and vice versa. So for this LA case, the average station spacing I used is uh, f from about 10 kilometers to 50 kilometers. Uh, I didn't use any station pairs larger than 50 kilometers because the um, colder waves just attenuate too much and the signal to noise ratio is not enough. Um, and also one limitation for this uh, relatively larger uh, space, station spacing is that uh, if we want to really study, you know, the very, very shallow parts uh, with high frequencies, um, this station spacing would be too large because the high frequency waves will attenuate, uh, attenuate faster. Um, so for um, the studies I mentioned today, uh, we're all using say free data, the uh, data from permanent stations. But if we could uh, deploy say the nodal sensors, the um, geophones with much denser um, coverage, then we could get a um, much better spatial resolution as well as going into uh, much higher frequencies. That means going into a very shallow um, part of the subsurface. Uh, but if uh, we're limited by this type of uh, irregular or not so uh, ideal coverage, uh, station coverage, then we could uh, really try to use the Voronoi tessellation to quantitatively assess uh, our spatial resolution. I Thank hope that answered your question. Thank you for that. There are a few related questions. Um, we had one, one person write in wondering about uh, whether you could use non-broadband stations. And you just mentioned deploying seismic nodes. I would guess that the, the, the drawback in not having a broadband station pair would be that because you don't have as broad a range of frequencies, you just see, you, you only see shallower and not deeper. Is that correct? Uh, right, so actually one uh, advantage of doing this seismic interferometry is that when we do this cross creation of, you know, the raw data or the noise data, the coherent parts are enhanced, uh, the decoherent parts were uh, depressed. So uh, with, you know, four uh, short period sensors, although the, say, uh, spectral response of the raw data is not as you know, good as broadband stations. But after this cross um, process um, processing, uh, we could actually get pretty uh, signal to noise ratio for a broad range of frequencies. And actually uh, the, I think the, um, the this, this um, measurement I'm showing you here at the gathers are mostly obtained with uh, geophone data. Okay. Uh, not with broadband stations. You, you talked briefly about um, using the, the CODA wave uh, interferometry and kind of how that influenced sort of the, the maximum distance that you could have between stations. There was a question here. I think this was specifically in regards to your LA basin analysis. They said you mentioned using 50 stations to apply a CODA wave interferometry in order to, reach, to retrieve delta V over V. Did you use all pairs of stations? And if not, what criteria did you apply to select your pairs? Yes, yeah, so for this LA study, I used all the pairs within 50 kilometers. Okay. Yes, it's uh, really determined by looking at my cross collision data. And I uh, saw that, you know, if I try to use larger station spacing, the uh, coherence signals are not so significant. Okay. Uh, Matteo Acosta wrote in with a question that had also occurred to me. It says, is there, uh, is there any indication in Delta V over V of elastic recovery of the aquifers due to the very recent massive rainfalls in California? I don't know. Have you looked at any recent data and can you see any uh, signals? 
That's a good question. So perhaps I could show you quickly. Uh, this is something we looked at um, at the end of January, actually. Uh, you could see, so this was um, the, this is a data view over V from, I think the beginning of 2019 to the end of uh, the past January. And uh, you could see, uh, so here still upwards means more groundwater. Okay. And you could see uh, corresponding to the very recent storms, the wild weather in California, the yeah. groundwater is increasing uh, dramatically. Um, although uh, very different from surface water, which, you know, they, the surface water recovers very quickly, but the groundwater, for groundwater, it takes some time. Mm -hmm. um, I think the last storm in this round was around maybe January 15th, but uh, it's still, uh, it was still increasing at the end of January. So we decided that uh, maybe we could give it some time to settle before we look at it again. But okay. uh, this type of approach would be very helpful for assess the recovery of groundwater and maybe to provide um, an evaluation of say, Fault indices um, for groundwater reservoir. There was another question here. Um, this is I'm wondering if you'd noticed any velocity variations caused by stress transients. Is that something you'd looked for, or had you seen uh, that? In the data? Yes, yes. So uh, maybe I could pull up this figure again, and you could see uh, this big jump here. Uh, so this is measurement with daily resolution. And you can see this big jump uh, was corresponding to the Ridgecrest earthquake, which is a little bit far away, not too far away. Um, but this you do the jump see over this. In, 20, in July of 2019, right? Yes, in okay. early July 2019. And uh, this is uh, mostly due to the dynamic ground shaking uh, caused in LA Basin caused by the Ridgecrest earthquake. Awesome. That's mm -hmm. great. Uh, the question here asks, uh, do you think your method could be useful for glacier monitoring in order to determine the melting water content or trying to forecast avalanches, ice falls, or cabin? Yes, so there have been a couple of papers uh, work on showing the feasibility of this type of approach. Let me see if I have it. Uh, sorry, I don't have it in my backup slides, but it is uh, certainly um, possible to use the data view over V to uh, study the freezing and thawing uh, processes or say S sheet uh, mass balance. Yes, uh, I would refer uh, the uh, audience to the paper by uh, Fabian in 2021 and um, uh, Mordred uh, in 2016 on um, science advances um, okay. for this type of uh, applications. Another question asks, have you tried to assess quantitatively the amount of water that may cause certain delta V over variation? Yes, that's a good question. That's uh, something we would eventually want to resolve. Uh, so for this Alec study, we didn't. Um, because uh, I think uh, so far the modeling, say uh, physics-based modeling of data VORV from groundwater level or groundwater storage is still pretty, say, first order. They didn't take into account the differences of, say, different hydraulic conditions, either uh, unconfined aquifer or confined aquifer, those type of um, conditions. Um, but uh, this is something we are very interested in, and uh, we could probably uh, adopt a say empirical uh, approach to that um, to really estimate uh, or translate delta V or V into groundwater storage changes. Well, there's a question here that asks, um, are you aware of any attempts to use DAS for this type of analysis? And are there any possible challenges you could see with this sort of approach? Yes, so that's also a very good question. I didn't have time to mention. Uh, so what I'm showing you today are just using seismometers. Uh, so there are efforts going on. For example, the group of Professor Zhongwen Zhang at Caltech, uh, they try to use the dust data uh, around Ridgecrest earthquake. Uh, they deployed uh, to study the groundwater uh, changes. 
or I think for their study, they think they are mostly measuring the soil moisture changes for the top 10 uh, meters. So I think um, the differences between dust and uh, say seismometers uh, is first that um, dust data would be say typically more sensitive to the shallower depths. Uh, for this type of depths, uh, it's less about say groundwater changes, it's more about soil moisture uh, as well as thermal elastic strain. Another thing is that for dust, um, it has very high spatial resolution, right? Um, but it's a 2D profile. Mm -hmm. uh, what you have is a two, basically a 2D image, um, but with uh, dense seismic arrays, you could get a much better uh, 3D uh, images. Um, however, it's, uh, of course, the spatial resolution is not as good as uh, the measurements with dust. Okay. Um, maybe maybe just a few more questions here. I don't think we're going to have time to get to all of these, but uh, Mark asks, with delta V over V, is there a concern uh, that you need to remove the instrument responses among the various instrument types um, in your area of interest? Yes, so that is something we need to treat uh, very carefully. Um, so for this LA, so, um, first of all, when we do this type of delta V over V uh, calculation, uh, what we do first with the raw data is to remove the instrumental response. This is actually very important because if you don't do it and if you know the, there are changes of the instrument, you will detect a, a fake change in data V over V, right? So for this LA case study, it's less of a problem because all those are uh, permanent stations, um, broadband permanent stations that are very well managed. Um, but I think for other cases or more universal cases where, uh, you know, there, especially over a long um, period of time where the sensors changed a lot, you really need to make sure that uh, you remove all the instrumental response. Mm 